Hello and welcome to the Ways to Change the World podcast. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and this is the programme in which we talk to remarkable people about their big ideas for the world we live in and how to change it and make it a better place and the events that have helped shape their thoughts. And my guest this week is a man who has held some of the great offices of state. He's been in British politics for decades. He's famous for all sorts of things, for his interest in the inner cities, for being the man who challenged Margaret Thatcher and began the end of her period in office. And he is still active at the age of 85 in British politics, making speeches that go around the internet right now, campaigning for uh, a reversal of the Brexit decision in the 2016 referendum. Lord Heseltine, thank you very much indeed for thank you very much. joining us. People on this programme often shy away from the phrase change the world because uh, it's a, it's a, they think it's a grandiose phrase. But how important do you think it is to think big in politics? This is one of these sort of questions that have no answer and every answer. Um, it, it depends on who you are and what your attitudes are. Um, uh, there are people who, who, by nature, think outside the box, think big. There are others who are exactly the opposite. I mean, I, I found that when faced with a challenge, people very easily, and this is oversimplifying, divide into two categories. There are those who say, how do we fight our way out of this? How do we build? How do we attract more customers? How do we widen the horizons? And those who say, oh, it's all very difficult. We must be cautious, must be careful. In business, we must cut the back, tailor ourselves to the cloth. Um, and, and there are those two different sorts of people. So it's no use saying to the instinctively cautious, think big, because that's not the way they approach things. Equally, it's quite difficult to say to those who take the big view, why don't you be more cautious? Did you always think big? Well, you know, that, again, you're implying that somehow or other I'm bigger and better. And, uh, but it, I always, looking back over my life, have been on the side of those who looked to the expansionary opportunities. I mean, I started off in adult life as a businessman. Well, you know, entrepreneurs are prepared to take the leap. <laughs> Often it's quite uncharted waters. Um, and in politics, I've always taken the view that I had views. That's why I was in politics. And, you, you know, you've got to take a bit of a chance if you want to influence people. It's no use just sitting there and hoping the tide will wash your ideas up the beach. You made a, a speech in the House of Lords very recently about Brexit, warning uh, of how future generations would view this decision and view the position of the Conservative Party. Um, do you feel this generation of politics is making a mess of things? Well, we are in a mess. I think it's very dangerous to sort of try and generalise to the whole generation of politics. Uh, there's some first-class people, wonderful people, uh, in the political arena, in the House of Commons, on both sides. There always are good people, and there always will be, in my view. But we're in a mess. And I think I know why we're in a mess. It's because uh, the instinct of democracy is to look for change if there's a period of prolonged dissatisfaction. And there has been. It's all tied up with the collapse of 2008. You hear the same arguments on the both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, President Trump is a classic example. It's no accident Nigel Farage was campaigning for President Trump. It was the same argument that, that you know, I offer you a better future. I offer you a greater America. I offer you a more prosperous opportunity. You must, we must have change. You hear the same argument in France or Germany or Italy um, because for a protracted period of time, since 2008, we've been cutting back. We'd overspent. Everyone had overspent. The governments had overspent. The companies had overspent. Personal debt was too high. And it, there was a price to pay. And people didn't like that. And so they were listening and looking for someone to articulate change. And if you can add the toxic arguments of immigration into the frustrations of economically frozen living standards, then you have a pot 
that uh, stirs effectively in appealing to votes. But it, it's also happened at the same time that a lot of these communities have, have felt alienated from power and from politicians who hold power. And so they have been ripe, if you like, I suppose, for, um, you know, for rallying around another cause. I think that uh, politicians can't escape public opinion, and that is more so today than ever. If you take one of the big manifestations of public opinion, and, and Brexit has dominated week after week, if you listen to the reaction, it's quite obvious that there is absolutely no agreement at all about the cause, about the, the, the risks, about the opportunities. Um, and the politicians, they know that. This is a deeply divided issue, a divisive issue, nothing like it in my time. And um, so the House of Commons reflects that. It's not that somehow a So this was inescapable? It was, I think, inescapable. After the crash of 2008, there'd be a great period of uncertainty. What, what should we do now? Well, I haven't the slightest doubt what we should do now. First of all, face up to the causes, which is the collapse of uh, 2008, and uh, run our economies uh, on a more prudent basis, so you don't have another collapse. Secondly, we should restore the conditions of growth, which we had just done. Britain had become the fastest growing economy in Europe. And that the way to do that is to give confidence to people who are going to invest and create the jobs. Overseas companies are going to come here. And the way to do that is to restore in full our membership of the European Union. The second issue is immigration. And immigration is the most difficult political issue. It has been throughout history. It's something people hesitate to talk about because before you know where you are, you're talking about racial differences and all of that. It's immensely difficult. But uh, the immigration Im issue from Europe was the second ingredient. Fear of jobs, foreigners taking our jobs, who are they, what are they allowed here for, they're living on the health service. You know all the arguments, and many a great deal worse than that. Those arguments have been here throughout history. There's nothing new in them. It's just they've got a new form. And um, the interesting thing in the European context is that now the overseas immigration from outside Europe is in a different league of scale to those coming from Europe. And that was the case whilst Theresa May was Home Secretary for all those years. Why did she do nothing about it? If this was the burning issue, and the reason why I think she didn't do anything is because our social services depend upon the skills. Not, not, not a lot of idle people living on the health service. It is the skills of the doctors and the nurses in the health service that have come from outside, many of them not from Europe, from uh, uh, other parts of the world, that actually make immigration a very important strength to our economy. And the government didn't want to be put in a position where it is obviously controlling these numbers, creating shortages here, lengthening the queues um, in a way that would have happened if immigration had been controlled in the way they wanted it to be. So what is the answer to tackling the immigration issue? Well, I mean, I, do you pander to it and say, no, well, no, we, we no, must control no, it? No, no. Well, you, you have to control it. The fact of the matter is immigration is not just an issue of today, it is here for as far ahead as we can see for many reasons. Everywhere in the world, the least privileged, and there are billions of them living in conditions we just wouldn't recognize, look to see the conditions in which we live. And they're going to come here. And it won't be the idlers and the shirkers that come. It will be the more energetic, more ambitious, who want something for themselves and their families, they will come. And we will have to control that because there is no way we can absorb the huge numbers that uh, w would like to be here. And so do you think that means that freedom of movement has to stop within the European Union? I think that, I, I think that out of this controversy about Brexit, there is a way in which we could go to the Europeans. David Cameron tried, but the mood in Europe has changed since then. 
and say, look, we recognize that immigration can only happen at a measured pace. And so there were three things that we as Brits would say as we continue our membership of the European Union. First of all, there needs to be a wall, a common wall, around the European Union. And we will use our full endeavors to help you police it. Full stop. Secondly, in terms of the free movement, which is a principle of the European Union, we would accept the principle, but we would say that where the components of the European Union are out of kilter, so that you have very poor countries and very rich countries, there has to be a rate at which the immigration can take place. In other words, a cap in any one year on the numbers that could move under the free movement procedure. It would not be a cap singling out French or German or Dutch or um, any other Romanian national group. It would simply a cap on the number of European citizens that could move to any one of the more prosperous economies. And the third policy is that we should look at our aid programs, the European aid programs, which is huge, and we should mold them into a Marshall Plan where we say to the countries from which the immigrants are coming, we will help you rebuild or build anew your economies so that you can keep more of your younger and more talented people there. To stop the pressure? To stop the pressure. I mean, what makes you think Europe would accept that? Because in this Brexit debate, lots of people have said, well, this is what we should say to Europe. Um, and it's been, you know, people call it cakeism or fantasy politics or unicorns. I mean, what makes you think our European partners would accept your idea? I think that they've woken up in a way they hadn't when David Cameron tried, tried two years ago. The problems, you see it everywhere. You see the growth of Le Pen, you see the AFG, you see the problems in Italy, uh, you see the Dutch, you see the Hungarians and the Poles. You see these problems now are mainstream in Europe in a way they were not when David Cameron first tried. So I believe that they would listen. I think public opinion would make them listen. And that would be my approach. But the difference between the approach I've outlined and the one that is uh, at the heart of our present position is that I want to build a peaceful, united, democratic, prosperous Europe. And so they would listen, because that's what they want on behalf of the individual nation states. I mean, it's interesting that you, the first word you used there was peaceful. And I, and I wonder whether that's because you're one of the few politicians still in active politics who remembers the war. Uh, it, it is an indelible fact of my memory. I looked at Piccadilly Circus the night the Second World War ended. I was there, I was six, when I listened to Neville Chamberlain declare that we were at war with Germany. And so, of course, I know where the European movement came from. The European movement, today, we hear it all from people saying, oh, it was all economics. It wasn't economics at all. It was the determination of a generation of men and women who had been conquered and vanquished and occupied the homes of the battlefields and the cemeteries of the wars, three in three quarters of a century for France and Germany. It must never happen again. But hasn't the risk of war gone now? I mean, and, and Europe is a political and economic giant. And, and you know, is there really a risk of a return to, to violence in Europe? Well, I personally think not. But let us remember what has also gone. The fascists have gone from Spain and Portugal. The Greeks have gone from, I'm sorry, the colonels have gone from Greece. The communists have gone from Italy and France. And on our doorstep, in Bosnia, Serbia, all these places that have been tinderboxes, they are in a position where they're under the shadow of the European Union, which is consistent of democratically elected governments. Do you, do you, I mean, do you remember the point at which you, in politics, became a believer in the European project? Yes, when I was at Oxford. And 
uh, of course, I was in my late teens. But Winston Churchill was making speeches about a kind of United States of Europe. The European movement was growing. Lead us, they said. And we didn't and wouldn't. But there was a chilling interview on the BBC by Rab Butler, one of the architects of the recovery of the post-war period. It wasn't on, you see. It wasn't on. We were quite wrong, of course, but it wasn't on. You mentioned remembering the outbreak of war. How much of the, the bombing do you remember? Because you, you came from Wales, and I mean, presumably you, you remember what happened there. Uh, my f mother and sister and I followed my father around uh, from the various military posts he went during the war. So I wasn't there all the time in Swansea, but there I was there enough for some of the worst uh, um, uh, air raids. And I remember it, it's funny what you remember as a child. The bombers came every night at nine o'clock, every night. And we had a shelter in the basement. And our little Scotty dog, he knew they were coming because he was always there at nine o'clock waiting for us to open the door to go down into the shelter. And I can remember standing in the garden of One Upland's Crescent, Swansea, with my grandfather watching the searchlights and the shape of the balloon, barrage balloons. So yes, I do remember it all. What kind of childhood was it? Was it, was it a, a privileged childhood or...? It was a middle class, uh, not hugely uh, privileged, but compared with the conditions of uh, the unemployed in the working class valleys, very privileged. Did that shape your own relationship with people who were less fortunate? Where did that come from? I, I, think, I think it has, it is a good question, because you, you know, you don't work these things out day by day and say, what am I, what do I think, why am I being influenced by this? But looking back, you couldn't live in Swansea, in a relatively prosperous part of Swansea, with access to the Gower Peninsula, which of course is a sort of paradise on earth, without knowing about the hinterland, to which for various reasons one would go or drive through, pass through, whatever it was. And, and particularly, I remember in the um, 1950s, my father died when I was young, driving back and forth down the heads of the valley road. And you couldn't, you couldn't escape the scars of the Industrial Revolution. I remember another what, incident so small, but nevertheless the impact in, on me, that um, I was a, at, at a well-known and leading public school, and I had wandered from the campus into a fairly poor part of Shrewsbury. And turning a corner there was this little girl, four or five, something like that, very like my sister, except the clothes were not like my sister. And I just, the instant reaction, you know, there is another world. I, my first job was working in the city of London, and that, that had an effect on me. You saw this incredible tide of people coming across the bridges and going back. Huge offices, faceless offices, you know. And I thought, this, I don't know, this doesn't sound right to me. Well, most people have go through those sort of stages in their youth. Uh, but I very rapidly came to see that enlightened capitalism was the generator of wealth, and wealth is the essential tool of building out from poverty. Did you become a conservative because that was your class and that was your position, because your father was a conservative? No, I think, I think those, those are, are, are very good questions. I come from a background of middle-class background, entrepreneurial background. You can trace back people in my ancestry who were entrepreneurs. Uh, so I was brought up in that atmosphere, 
My father was an engineer, a grammar school boy, an engineer. And um, uh, so, yes, we, I was brought up in a broadly conservative background, but you not a political background. There were no real politics in, in my family, but we were natural conservative voters. You made a lot of money very quickly as a young man, didn't you, in property. How did that shape your view of politics? Because you then, later on in life, became a big um, proponent of the right to buy, uh, council yes. housing. And I just wonder whether there was a relationship between those two things. I think that I was very lucky in that my grandparents had, over a long period of time, created a post office savings account for me. By the time I left um, Oxford, I had a thousand pounds. Now, of course, a thousand pounds then is much more than a thousand pounds now, but that's what it was. And then uh, the inexplicable, unaccountable moment, I won't have a thousand pounds. So I found another friend who got a thousand pounds and we bought a boarding house which had 11 rooms, we occupied two and sublet the other nine. And we sold the boarding house a year later for double what we paid for it, and we bought a small hotel. And so that's how I got into, in quotes, the property business. <laughs> um, but I'd always, perhaps inherited, it's difficult to know, but I'd always had a, a feeling that I'd like to be financially independent which was to be ch transformational in my life because uh, it was the fact that I was independent of anyone else's ability to influence my income that enabled, that gave me freedom. I, nobody could frighten me or threaten me, or whatever it was. I had the resources to stand on my own feet. The, the story about you was always that you'd sketched out your future on an envelope. I was had, that ever true? No, I don't think so. It is very uncharacteristic of me, you know, um, I, I'm not given to making public commitments about what I think will happen. I, there's a caution in, in my judgments. Uh, I know exactly where it came from. It came from a friend of mine who was a brilliant journalist, but he couldn't resist a laugh. And you, I you said millionaire by 25, cabinet by 35. There's, or, there's, or I, I, just, I just don't believe it ever happened. Well, let's go forward then to the Thatcher years. Um, because that, you're, you're then in power and you're, you're in the cabinet and you were doing all sorts of interesting things. Um, what, what, did you, what did you see as your purpose in that stage as a cabinet minister um, who, who was very involved in the cities and uh, was responding to rioting in Liverpool in quite a, a different way to, to one you'd expect a Conservative cabinet minister to react? The the job Margaret gave me was Environment Secretary. And Peter Shaw, the Labour outgoing Secretary of State, had taken a particular interest in the problems of Liverpool. I self-evidently had played no part in that decision of his. Civil servants said to me, would you like to continue this? Secretary said, I said, yeah, why not? Two years later, they rioted. And I could have said, call the police jobs on the streets. But I felt a personal responsibility. This was a city I had personally associated myself with, done, I thought, a lot to help. Do you, do you think that much has changed? Yeah, yes. It's unrecognisable. Now, if you say to me, to this generation, 30 years or whatever it is on, has it changed? I'll say, no, no, it's the same problem. They have no idea what it was like in 1981 when I was coping with this. I mean, everybody asked about their present situation defines it today. There is very little collective memory of what it was like 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. We are incomparably a more prosperous society today than we were then. Poverty today is a different sort of poverty to what it was in the 1920s or 1930s. Um, but politicians have to live with the real world, with today's world. So it's no use sort of saying you're better off than you were or you're better off than your family or your parents were. Cut any ice. And were you trying to change the world at that stage? Did you, were you thinking in a very ambitious way? Well, no, I, I wasn't trying to change the world. I was trying to change 
Liverpool. And, uh, but of course, it is absolutely true that the lessons of Liverpool dramatically influenced my way in which I think the country should be governed. Uh, so uh, this was a formative part of my life, and I realised the incredibly debilitating effect that the centralism of power in Whitehall has had on our society. London is very important. It is the golden goose. Nothing must be done to prejudice it. But the rest of our cities, the cities that built the most incredible centre of power the world has ever seen, the British Empire, they have been neutered by the power of Whitehall. Even members of Parliament representing local constituencies, before you know where you are, they're in the House of Commons and their career ladder is up the ministerial ladder. And that focuses their attention on their functional responsibility transport, housing, health, whatever it is, and it m removes them from thinking about the greater interest of Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, all that. Um, let's come right up to date for a moment and sort of see how it relates to your career, because as we speak, um, the Conservative government is in crisis, Conservative MPs are trying to work out whether they should get rid of Theresa May as Prime Minister. We had a, uh, an opposition MP picking up a, a mace in the House of Commons. Um, of course, you famously picked up a mace in the House of Commons um, in, in, in uh, protest during a debate, and you were the man who challenged Margaret Thatcher and saw her off. How do you view what's going on right now? Well, I know that if this was a Labour government, the Tory party would tear it apart over Brexit. If the Labour party were advocating Brexit, the Tory party would tear it apart. Because the self-interest of this country, self-evidently, depends our presence at the heart of Europe. And all this stuff about sharing power and gaining power and sovereignty, it's all slogans. It's got no relationship to the real world that we live in, to the scale of the challenge of China, America, India, compared with the nation state of our size. Um, but the loyalty to the party is deeply ingrained in the political process. And uh, whilst there were some very brave conservatives holding the fort and standing by their own convictions as to what our national interest is, there were too many who are in one of two camps. Those who just said it's a quiet life, it's it's all we can do, the people have spoken and all that. And those who are the, the, the Brexiteers, who are driven by these obsessions uh, of yesteryear, by the delusions of the role of a medium-sized economy and nation-state in tomorrow's world, ignorant, ignorant of the wishes of the generations yet to come. It is appalling, appalling that 70% of our young people want to stay in Europe, and they're being ignored by the 70% of old people who want to leave. But how, how important is the Prime Minister's leadership here? Well... And, and the question of who is Prime Minister? What I was going to say, who is leading? I mean, this is the lady who told us in the uh, referendum campaign our national self-interest was to be in the European Union. Now we're told it's to leave the European Union. There's no other way, no other deal. Well, I, I mean, frankly, I, I, I can't, uh, seeking for modest language, uh, this is someone who has flipped from one view to one that is quite inconsistent with it. But having been here before, I mean, you, 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 you took the decision at some point in time that Margaret Thatcher had to go. How do politicians... You know, politicians really, you know Actually, it wasn't quite like that. All I know is I left Margaret Thatcher's government in 1986 and I was determined to keep myself in frontline politics, believing that whoever became the next leader would bring me back. That I believed. Secondly, I believed the poll tax was a political and moral mistake. Then Geoffrey Howe resigned. I knew nothing about that, although he was a very good friend of mine. I was amazed when it happened. 
and I, but the words he used, it is now for others to determine. As I sat behind him listening to him, I thought, oh my God, the whole press will be on to me. I misunderstood his words, I'm now persuaded. He was, when he said it'll be for others to decide, he was actually referring to the cabinet. And of course the cabinet did decide, because when uh, I stood and uh, I didn't get enough votes on the first round, her colleagues told her that she would lose if she went to the second round. That's why she went. Now, of course, I was an agent in this process. Let's not have any illusions about that. But it is not right to technically say, I got rid of her. No, but you, you stood, is what you're saying. So the, there was a moment where you said, right, it is now my duty to stand. Um, and to, I, I think and to it be wasn't counted. quite what I said. It was um, really, do I say to the, the first journalist I meet, no, I'm not going to do it. Uh, or do I say there is no real option for me but to do it? And th it was much closer to the second. I was quite happy to wait for Margaret to go. And if I had, I would almost certainly have become leader of the party. Indeed, there was a magic moment in my life when I left the chamber having listened to Geoffrey and I came across an old friend who'd been Chief Whip Michael Jopling. And I said to him, and it reflects, it reflects what I really felt at the time, Michael, what the hell do I do now? So what should Conservative MPs be thinking now? You know, how do they decide when it's the right time to get rid of Theresa May? Well, that's the problem they've got, because they can't decide who to get rid of her with. And that is the problem, because the candidates, and there are plenty of them, they're all over the press all, every day, none of them can see that they can win. So the, their best policy is not to fight until they can see an opening. Uh, and that's where we are, and that's her great strength. Can you see a possible Prime Minister in that pack? No. but I'm not asking you to name one, I'm no, just saying no, can no, you see I, one? I, I, no, I don't, I don't see... Uh, for, for that's one, terrible, isn't it, for, that there isn't a possible well, Prime Minister well, in the Cabinet? Well, there's one great problem I have, and it's one I, why I was so certain in my answer. And that is, there's not much point in changing the uh, singer unless you change the song. And the sort of people posturing around are largely people who are Brexiteers. And some of them, of course, are Brexiteers because it suited their career to stay loyal. Whether they'd remain Brexiteers if they had the responsibility to implement it is a, an interesting question I would begin to know. So do you think it would be better if this government fell I and was replaced I by a different government with a different idea? Well, I don't think this government is going to fall um, myself because uh, uh, the Tory party would have to vote for it and I don't see them doing that. Uh, it will fall in the end because uh, you know, it's got a fi fixture of a five-year period. But for your beliefs, I mean, uh, difficult though it is as a Conservative, shouldn't you wish for a new government? Well, it depends what the new government's going to do. Um, well, if there's one that agrees with you. <laughs> ah, but that's where, where the problem is. Now, I think that at the moment I can't see that scenario. Um, the only way I can see that that happening is with another referendum, which, of course, is what I believe should happen. But that is more likely today to come from a splintering of party loyalties within the House of Commons than from an adherence to party loyalties. I mean, do we have time for, for the two main parties to be recaptured by the other sides um, when Brexit is imminent? I think the great danger for the Conservative Party is that they will struggle on, unable to go for an early general election, which they wouldn't think they could win, and then be blamed for the Brexit and the consequences, and then forced into opposition. That is the danger, that the Conservatives will be blamed for Brexit. What makes you think a second referendum would overturn the view of the first? Well, I think that beyond any question, people know a great deal more now than they did then. And I think that the hysteria of Project Fear will be very difficult to rerun. Um, 
I think there have been so many forecasts and analyses which is in the public domain, including the government's own forecasts, showing that Brexit is worse off in any scenario, that I cannot believe the British people are going to vote to make themselves worse off. If they do, I'm a Democrat. But haven't they already? I mean, no, you know, they, they were told no, that they, they would be they, worse off they were and they voted for it. They were told they could have their cake and eat it. They were told £350 million a week to the health service. They were told every manner of exaggeration. your side told them they'd be worse off. I, I'm accepting that there were exaggerations on both sides. I'll accept that. So let's accept that both sides misled. Now we know the facts. Let's put it back to the one group of people who could perhaps change the position democratically. Although the Brexiteers don't accept that we'll be worse off, do they? I mean, Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg still think Britain can be better off outside the European Union than in. And that's what they would argue in a second referendum. So does Nigel Farage. Yes, well, that's they would. And... Uh, it's very interesting, you see, I mean, Boris was Foreign Secretary for two years. With all the imagery and phraseology and uh, uh, enticement of everything he'd said in the referendum. And after two years, nothing. No deal. I, the one thing Theresa May got right, and I take the tiniest credit because I advised her to do so in an article in the Mail on Sunday, two days after the referendum, put the Brexiteers in charge. If she hadn't put Boris, David Davis and Liam Fox in charge, the, the history would have been written very differently. But she put three of the most articulate Brexiteers in charge. And after two years, nothing. What's your advice to her now? Oh, I mean, she sacked me. My advice is not going to count for much. Well, what would you do if you were put in charge? Oh. Well, I would do two things. I would go now back for a referendum because I can't see an alternative. And the question would be what? Uh, well, it would include the, the uh, um, decision to stay. Um, and that would be the only one because this present deal isn't going through. There's no point in putting that on the, on the table. So it's in or out in the light of what you know. Uh, and I would then make a speech in setting out my views, which would be that this will restore Britain's um, economic fortunes and I have a plan to deal with immigration. That's what I would do. And uh, I would put that to the Commons and if I lost, I'd, I'd let someone else have a go. The, the other side will say you're telling people they didn't know what they were voting for, they were stupid, they were too stupid to understand. That's, that's the current riposte to any question of a second referendum. What's your answer to that? I've never said they were too stupid. Um, uh, they didn't know what they were voting for. That, how could they? How can they? How, at this day, as we haven't got an effective government or an, accept, an acceptable policy, how can anyone know what they're voting for? Today, two years later. And there were, and we've discussed, there were the deceptions. Let's, let's not issue it. Let's say they were on both sides. We're now in a situation where a significant more information is available. But it's perfectly true, it's perfectly true to say that the whole of the internal relationships is yet to be negotiated. And each of those is going to be a direct affront of British national self-interest. And we're going to lose a lot of those. So, in a sense, there's a deception about even the plan that Mrs May is putting forward, that it's full of phrases and not evidence. But it's m better than where we were two years ago. And just finally, if this goes ahead, what will you feel? Sad that my generation betrayed the young generation. Sad that we denied Britain's historic role at the centre of Europe. Sad that we stood down from our position as one of the leading countries of our sort in the world. We gave up power. I can't understand that. Lord Hazeltine, thank you very much indeed.